Eric Stud. This evening, let's spend a few moments of silent prayer to prepare ourselves for the teaching of God's word. God's word is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in the spirit and in truth. So with that being said, let's prepare ourselves for the teaching of God's word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful uh, to be alive. We thank you for the reminder uh, this Christmas season of your uh, uh, amazing love for us, the greatest expression of your love is you sending your son into the world to uh, uh, become a man so that he may go to the cross and suffer um, because of our sin. And so thank you for this reminder of your love and the gift of our eternal salvation, the gift of your son. We just ask of you as we study your word to clean us from all sin so that we can be able to fellowship with you and be able to learn so that we can grow in your word. Thank you for those who are here uh, to study your word. And I just pray uh, that you will meet their needs and that you have blessed them uh, through their study this evening. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so let's get back into this study here. Uh, if you're just joining us, uh, we're continuing our uh, uh, doctrine of sin. Uh, we're looking at what the Bible uh, says about sin. As I mentioned to you all in our first study, uh, this is a subject that most people uh, do not want to talk about, uh, don't want you to teach it, uh, and, and feel offended when you do teach it, uh, the doctrine of sin, and we saw why that's the case. Most people want to see themselves in a good light, and they don't want to see themselves how the Bible see us. Uh, the Bible see us as sinners. And 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 and, and we need to see ourselves as sinners um, before we can realize that we need to be saved. And so uh, um, that is one reason why men don't like this subject, because this subject uh, 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 shine light on who we really are. We are sinners and we need to be saved. And it also shows us why our Lord Jesus Christ had to come into the world uh, is because of our sinful condition. I gave you a definition of sin. The word sin in the New Testament is the Greek word harmartia, and it means a departure from divine standards, a departure from divine standard. The Bible is the standard set by God that measures right and wrong conduct, right and wrong thoughts and words. And so any deviation from the Bible or the standard set by God is sin. See, men do not determine what is right and what is wrong. Sin only occurs when men violate a standard set by God in his word. If we don't violate a standard set by God, then we're not sinning. And we violate God's standard because we all possess a nature called the sin nature that tempts us to commit sin that is against God's standard and sin that is contrary to the holy character of our God. Sin is anything unlike God's character. It is missing the mark of God's character and missing the mark of God's holy standard. Sin is a form of selfishness. Uh, selfishness. Sin is a form of independence. And sin is not living according to the standards of God. We also saw that there are three sources of temptation to sin. There is three sources of temptation to sin. The first source of temptation to commit sin that goes against God's standard and character is the devil. Second, the sin nature that lives in the body of every believer received from Adam. And then the world, which is a satanic system that is designed to corrupt our minds 
and lead us into sin. Those are the three sources of sin. We also saw in our last class that the Bible revealed three kinds of sins. And that is imputed sin. Imputed sin is one type of sin. And imputed sin is Adam's sin being charged to our account. So in other words, when Adam sinned, he represented all of us humans. And so when he came under the penalty of sin through his sin, all of us share in that penalty because we all were in Adam when he sinned. Though we have never committed a personal sin, we were in Adam when he sinned because we're all descendants of Adam. So when Adam received the penalty of sin, which were spiritual death and separation from God, we too were in Adam, therefore we too share in Adam's penalty. And that what it mean by imputed sin, Adam's sin charged to all of his descendants. Another kind of sin we saw was inherent sin. Inherent sin is a result of Adam's sin. We all receive a sin nature. When Adam had intercourse with his wife Eve, he passed the sin nature to all of his seed, all of his descendants. And that is that nature in us that tempts us to sin, serve self, and live life independent of God. So all men inherit Adam's sin nature, which entices and enables them to commit personal sin. See, sin is when we are unwilling to abide in this sphere that God has placed us. And then the third kind of sin is called personal sins, personal sins. Now, personal sin falls into three categories, thoughts, words, and actions. Those are personal sins. And so tonight we're going to begin looking at personal sins. Personal sins are acts that violate the standards of God. And those actions that violate God's standard falls into three categories, sinful thoughts, sinful words, and sinful actions. Remember, the Bible determines right and wrong. The Bible is God's standards. And any deviation from God's standards is a sin. And so we're going to look at these three categories of sin. And the more of God's word we know, the more we realize that we are sinning. A lot of people don't uh, understand the nature of sin because they don't study the Bible. Now, let's look at thoughts. We'll start with the first category of sin, and that is sinful thoughts. Now, we looked at two examples of sinful thoughts. We saw one example is partiality. When you are partial or show partiality or have personal favoritism between one person over another, that is a form of sin. We also saw, and that was in James chapter 2, verse 89, coveting. Whenever you see a man or a wife or a, uh, 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 a man's wife or a uh, woman's husband and you uh, desire that person, that is called coveted, coveting or greed. When you mentally desire something that belongs to someone else, we see that in Exodus 20, verse 17, that we should not covet. That is God's standard. God's standard is that we should not covet that which belongs to another person. And so coveted is a thinking sin. Jealousy. Jealousy is a thinking sin. Envy. When you envy someone, that is a thinking sin. Pride. Pride is a thinking sin. That's selfish ambition, which is a mental sin. Bitterness or resentment is a think of, uh, thinking sin. Unforgiveness or holding grudges. 
because you're thinking or reminding yourself of a wrong done to you and you fail to forgive the person. So thinking sin lead to action sins. Unforgiveness is a thinking sin. When you hold grudges and you fail to release that individual who wronged you from the debt they owe you, that is a sin because we're told to forgive as God has forgiven us. Malice is a thinking sin. And we see some of these in Ephesians 4. So open your Bible. We're talking about thinking sins. Open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 through 32. Ephesians 4, 29 through 32. Ephesians 4, 29 through 32. Ephesians 4, 29 through 32. Verse 29 uh, reads, Let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, but only such a word as good for edification according to the need of the moment. Well, actually in verse 29, we since we're already here, we see a a a a um a word, uh, a sinful word here, and in other words, sins of the tongues, we see in verse 29 when, when the scriptures say, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word is good for edification. So in other words, whenever we speak a word that does not build someone up, that do not promote love for the for, for, for others, then that is a sinful word. If our words don't build up or promote love, then it is sin. It may That sin may affect others, but it is a sin against God. So any words that do not promote love or do not build up is a sin. Then so that it will be giving grace to those who hear. In verse uh, 30, say, do not grieve, the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you with all malice. So here we see bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, and malice. These are all thinking sin. These are things that we allow ourselves to think about, which actually thinking sin leads to action sin, uh, verbal sins and action sin. Like gossip starts with uh, bitterness and resentment uh, toward another person. Uh, and it leads to gossiping about those in, that individual. Slandering is a verbal sin. And so here we have bitterness uh, malice, um, what demonstrates unforgiveness. Verse 32 say, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also have forgiven you. So bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, and malice is a result of having an unforgiving spirit, having an unforgiving spirit, choosing not to forgive. Anger also demonstrates choosing not to forgive, but it all stems from the way a person is thinking. But here we're told in verse 32 that we're to forgive just as Christ also have forgiven us. So those are some examples of some other examples of thinking sin. Jealousy, envy, pride, bitterness, unforgiveness, malice, they are thinking sins. And we are, it, it demonstrates having a unforgiving uh, spirit. But notice in verse 30, it say that these sins grieve the Holy Spirit. So when a believer is committed to these sins, they are out of fellowship and they have grieved the Holy Spirit. And it's very difficult to walk in love toward another person with these thinking or mental sins. And then we have 
the other category of sin, and that is sinful words, sinful words. Bragging is, is um, sinful words. Whenever we brag and boast about who we are and what we have, uh, that is sinful word. Uh, I already mentioned gossiping is when uh, you're into everybody's business and tear people down through what you say about them. Uh, slandering when you assassinate another person's character to build yourself up. Uh, uh, when we slander somebody to build ourselves up or to uh, assassinate their character, that is slander. And, and what we say about them may be true, but we're not to be guilty of slander. Those are sinful words. Um, in Ephesians 5, verse 4, uh, foolish talking, foolish talking when we're uh, 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 joking about sin, sinful things, though that is foolish talking, and that is a a form of uh, a form of uh, sinful um, words. Go to Romans one verse twenty nine. Romans one twenty nine talks about boasting. Well, boasting and bragging is kind of the same, but here we see that boasting or bragging is a sin. It is a verbal sin, sinning with our tongue. Bragging and boasting do not build anyone up. Boasting and bragging actually builds us up and make us look good, but it may put the person who hear us bragging down if they don't possess what we possess. And that is Romans one twenty nine. Romans one twenty nine say, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossipers, slanderers, haters of God, um, uh, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parent. So here we see that being boastful and arrogant uh, boastful is a is a verbal sin. Being arrogant is a mental sin. Uh, slander is a word sin. Gossiping is words. Murder is an action sin. Envy is a mental sin. Greed is a uh, mental sin. Um, and so here we see boasting is a sin. Now here in Romans, Paul uh, showed what characterized the lifestyle of those who have rejected God is that their lifestyle is characterized by sinful things because they have been given in, given over to their flesh. And that's what happens whenever a unbeliever or a believer is under the control and influence of their sin nature. These are the type of things that characterize their thoughts, their words, and also their action because they're in the flesh without God. And so these are sinful words. And these sinful words can be very destructive. They can be very destructive as we see in James 3. Go to James 3, if you will. Go to James, James chapter 3, speaking of sins of the tongue. Go to James 3, verse uh, 1, 1 through... Uh, we're going to look at verse 1 through 10. James 1, verse 1 through 10. I think today we're, we may not be able to get off of this subject uh, of the sinful words or sins of the tongue because these are like some of the most destructive uh, a sin, and that is the sins of the tongue. Verse, verse, uh, chapter three, starting at verse one, reads, "Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he say, he is a perfect man, 
able to brighter the whole body as well. Now, if we put the bits into the horse's mouth so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also, though they are so great and are driven by strong wind, are still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a small part of the body and yet it boasts of great thing. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set on among our member as that would defile the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beasts and birds and reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing, my brother, these things ought not to be this way. So here we see that if we are able to tame our tongue or have self-control over our tongue, then we should be able to have self-control in every area of life. Now, sinful word stems from sinful thoughts. Sinful words stems from sinful thoughts. First, our thinking becomes uh, in error. Uh, and when, when we're thinking wrongly, we begin to uh, 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 sin with our tongues. In other words, nobody slanders, maligns somebody, judges somebody, or gossip about another person without the motivation of some type of mental sin. I'm going to say that again. No one assassinate another person's character, malign another person, judge another person, or even gossip about another person without first being motivated by some type of mental sin. Whether it be you're self-righteous or you think that you're better than another person, that leads to you know, gossiping or uh, uh, or slandering a person. Um, uh, um, if you assassinate their character, you may have some mental sin. They probably wronged you in the past and you fail to uh, forgive that person. And as a result, you assassinate their uh, character. When their name come up in a conversation, you find ways to attack that person's character because of a mental uh, sin that you're you're thinking and so mental sin so if a person is able to think different then they're able to say the appropriate things with their tongues and if we control our tongue then we're able to control how we behave you know in proverbs go to proverbs 6 if you will in proverbs 6 proverbs have something to say about some other sins of the tongue. In Proverbs 6, verse uh, 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 16 through 19, gives us uh, seven most grievous sins uh, as it relates to verbal sin. Now, of these seven grievous sins are uh, most horrible sin. Three of them are sins of the tongue. Proverbs 6, verse 16 through 19. Can I get a volunteer to read Proverbs 6, verse 16 through 19? The seven sins that God hates with three of them are, are verbal sins. Can anybody read, please? Thank you. Turn yourself, Miss Miller. Okay. There are six things which the Lord hates. Yes, 
seven, which are an abomination to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. Amen. So here we see in these seven sins that God hate, uh, well, it says six, six uh, things the Lord hate, but three of these uh, sins is verbal sin. The one is a lying tongue. That's a ver uh, verbal uh, sin. And then we have a false witness who utter lies. Okay. And then that's perjury. And then third, one who spread strife among the royal family. So strife, uh, someone who spread strife among brothers like gossip, slander, maligning, and, and judging. So uh, strife is spread through what? Gossip, slander, maligning, and judging. And these sins actually stem from self-righteous arrogance. These sins stem from a person is very arrogant, and as a result, they gossip, slander, malign, and judge others. They exalt themselves above others, and they cause strife between the brethren. It also involves legalism. It involves legalism. And legalism is when a uh, man, by uh, his own rules, uh, uh, think that he is acceptable uh, to God, and when others don't meet uh, his standard, uh, he gossip, slander, judge, and malign that person. Um, and and so these are some other verbal sin. And Paul warns us in the in the book of Romans about um, uh, verbal sins or sinning with our tongue. If you will, go to Romans chapter 2, Romans 2 verse 1, Romans 2 verse Romans 2, 1 says, Therefore, you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment, for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same thing. So you had individuals who were, according to their own standard, they were righteous. When they looked at the pagan Gentile lifestyle, they condemned the pagans as if they are not righteous because the pagans were doing blatantly sinning. And those who are morally good according to their own standard judge those who sin outwardly, whose sin is very evident, but they were committing the same sin and they thought that by condemning and judging uh, the pagan Gentile world, that they're going to escape the judgment of God. Look at verse, the second verse two said, and we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such thing. But do you suppose, oh man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you escape the judgment of God? So they thought that by passing judgment on others, that they can uh, uh, escape God just so they was kind of self the moral Gentiles were kind of self righteous and they thought that by judging others who were committing sin and they were doing the same sin but nobody really saw that they was doing the same thing that they're condemning others for doing and and they thought that by judging others that they're going to escape God's uh, judgment but here we see that they would not escape. And they thought that because God is not judging or disciplining them because of their sin, that 
that mean that God approve of their lifestyle. But the only reason God don't condemn us when we sin is because he's given us time to take responsibility for our sin. Uh, verse 4 say, or do you not think lightly of the riches of his kindness and his tolerance and his patience, not knowing that the kindness of God lead you to repentance? But because you're, you're stubborn and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So here, Paul say that these moral Gentiles were condemning the pagans who were living a sinful lifestyle that you could see that by condemning and judging them, they were going to escape God's judgment. But God say, you're doing the same thing. And therefore, you're, you will be judged. May not now, because I am being patient with you. And so judging does not exempt us if we're practicing the same thing from God's judgment. See, many legalistic and self-righteous believers think that their duty and responsibility is to bring up other people's sin. And the Bible say that that type of wisdom is not a wisdom that comes from God, according to uh, James. Go to James chapter 3, verse 14 through 16. According to James, it is not wisdom if we as believers sin with our tongue by bringing up other people's sin. That's gossiping. And it may be true, but we're not to worry about other people's business unless it's in a local church setting where the deacons are told and the church leaders are told to discuss among themselves about people who are leading others astray within the local assembly. But as individual believers, we're not to gossip. We're not to gossip because that's not wisdom. So uh, James 3, verse 14 through 16, James 3, 14 through 16. Look at verse 13 first. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior, his deed and gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not from above, but is earthly and natural. For where jealousy and selfish ambition is it, there is disorder in every evil thing. So here we see that jealousy, I mean, bitter jealousy, which gossiping is a form of bitterness. It, it, it comes from uh, uh, um, uh, a, a heart of bitterness and, and selfish ambition. Um, it also comes from bitterness in the heart. Gossiping and slander is, is, is lying. Uh, it comes from the mind too. So these are sins of the tongue, which stem from evil thinking, which is said to be demonic, which uh, said is not the wisdom of God here. Go to Romans, um, um, I'm since we're in James, let's go to James 4, verse 11. James 4, verse 11. In James 4.11, we're taught that uh, 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 do, uh, we're taught here not to speak against our brethren. Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you who judge your neighbor? Come now, you who say to them, well, we'll start right there. Verse 12 tells us 
that God is the lawgiver. It is his duty. It is his responsibility to, and it is his priority, uh, pro priority to, uh, uh, to deal with the believer who is sinning or living contrary to the word of God. It is not our job. When we do that, when we judge, when we gossip, when we slander, what we do in there, we're taking the place or uh, we're assuming the role of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're becoming the judge. And, and the deal is, none of us uh, uh, know everything there is to know about believers. Only God have perfect knowledge about these believers, so we're not to judge. And if, we're, if we are able to have self-control in what we say, then as the Bible say, we're able to control our whole body. So those are uh, some of the uh, sins of the tongue. Another sin of the tongue I just want to mention before we before we uh, move on, whining and complaining. Whining and complaining is another uh, sin of the tongue. And why is whining and complaining is a sin of the tongue? Because it goes against the standard set by God. In everything, we are to give thanks. In other words, God has blessed us. And the Bible reveals how much God has blessed us in his grace. So when we whine and grumble and complain, we're demonstrating that we're not appreciative or we have lost sight of our position in Christ and the blessing that God have given us as a result of our position in Christ. So complaining and whining is a sin because there are so many blessings that we could think about and contemplate in spite of the trials that we find ourselves in. In spite of the, uh, the, the, the things we find ourselves in, the trial we find ourselves in. Now I wanna I wanna move on from words, the sinful words, uh, with just the consequence of these verbal sins, consequence for verbal sin. Well, the consequences for verbal sin is 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 discipline by God. Divine discipline. Divine discipline is the results of verbal sins. If we slander another believer, then what happens is the discipline that that believer was supposed to get because of their actions that goes against the word of God, God gives us some of that discipline because we have taken the place of God in judging that believer. Because when we assassinate someone's character, gossip about another believer, that could cause suffering on that believer by how other people treat that believer. So if that believer is suffering as a result of our gossip or our slander, then God going to give us that person's discipline. And their action may be wrong, but now they're suffering because of our gossip or our slander. And so we get that person's discipline. Um, and so divine discipline is a result of the sins of the tongue. But there is great blessing when we avoid the sins of the tongue. Go to Psalm 34, 12 through 13. Psalm 34, 12 through 13. Psalm 34, 12 through 13. Everybody there? Can I get a volunteer to read, please? Anybody get somebody to read? I'd be happy to, if okay. nobody else wants to. All right, thank okay, you. Okay, and you want 12? 
12 through? 13, 12 and 13. Oh, just 12 and 13. Okay. Mm -hmm. Who is the man who desires life and loves length of days so that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Amen. So here we see blessing promised, long life promise and blessing promised to the believer who avoid the sins of the tongue. And since we know that blessing comes when we avoid the sins of the tongue, then as believers, it's important for us to recognize the sins of the tongue and separate from them. Recognize and separate. In Romans 16, in Romans 16, verse 17 and 18, we are urged to watch out and separate from sins of the tongue that we see in other believers. I urge you, Romans 16, let me get, help, let you get there. Go to Romans 16, verse 17 and 18. Seventeen and eighteen. Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who call dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learn, and turn away from them. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Jesus, but of their own appetite, and by their smooth and flattering sp speech they deceive the hearts of the unsuspected. So we are to watch out for those who saying with their tongue, who cause division amongst the brethren, who assassinate others' character to build themselves up. That's one of the reasons why I don't really watch a lot of the debates, uh, presidential debate. I look for I look for the day where a nominee just share what they were bring to the country rather than assassinate each other's character in public like that. And, and it just it just it just appeared to be arrogance when we exalt ourselves and, and just put everybody else down. Uh, I, I thought there was one year there was a president that uh I mean a nominee who he just you know Ben Carson I think it was I listen I listened to the debate uh, that he done and and I didn't see a lot of uh, like bashing another person and putting them down but not even he was perfect um, and there's no man perfect but I just long for the day where an individual will just share what they will bring to a country rather than putting everybody their their opponents down or, or bashing them or assassinating their character and integrity to exalt themselves. But anyway, that just that's just me. That's just me. Uh, but we are to avoid, especially within the church, uh, we're to avoid anybody that caused division through the sins of the tongue. We're to stay away from it because we want to be blessed um, by God. All right. Um, let me see. Let me go to, to one um uh, um uh, let me go to one more scripture before we have to start. Go to Psalm 5, 9 through 10. Psalm chapter 5, verse 9 uh, through 10. And here is Psalm 5, verse 9 through 10. We see that those who persist, uh, persist or are consistent in the sins of the tongue uh, uh, are headed for apostasy and destruction. Those who continue committing the sins of the uh, tongue are headed for apostles and destruction because the Bible tells us that we're to stay away from the sins of the tongue. So if we're not doing it. We're abandoning our faith. We're abandoning God's word and we're heading for destruction. Could you read again, Becky, if you don't mind, uh, Psalm 5 verse 9 through 10.
Psalm 5. Anybody? Anybody want to read Psalm 5? Oh, sorry. I read the whole thing and then I realized I was still on mute. Oh, you are. Go ahead. Sorry. No. Yeah, I already read through it. <laughs> I'll do it again. There is nothing reliable in what they say. Their inward part is the destruction itself. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. Hold them guilty, O God, by their own devices. Let them fall. In the Amen. multitude of their transgressions, thrust them out, for they are rebellious against you. Amen. So here we see those who are guilty and seem to continue in the sins of the tongue or have abandoned the faith, have abandoned God's word, and they're headed for destruction. And, and the psalmist say, hold them guilty. And in other words, they're headed for a fall when they continue down that path. You know, when we're able, one of the, the signs that a person is growing to spiritual maturity is when they're able to control their tongue. And we saw that in James 3, when we read James 3 earlier, we saw for if we all stump, I'm going to say that we all stump in many ways, but if anyone does not stump in what he say, he is a perfect man. In other words, he is a mature man, able to bridle the whole body as well. So, one of the results of growing is we're able to avoid the sins of Tom. And when I'm able to avoid the sins of the Tom, that is a sign of spiritual maturity. That is a sign of spiritual maturity. All right, well, we're going to have to stop right here and we'll continue on these personal sins sinful thoughts, sinful words, and sinful action uh, when we come back. In the meantime, let us control our tongues and stay away from the sins of the tongues so that we can be blessed uh, by God and continue to advance to spiritual maturity. Any questions or comments about our study uh, today? Any questions or comments? Any questions or comments? All right, well, let's stop right here. Father, we're so grateful for the provisions of your word. Your word is a lamp to our feet, light to our paths, and we all are guilty at some time of another of sinning with our tongues, but we desire to obey you. We desire to uh, not violate your standard, but uh, promote love in what we say. So we ask you by your grace, through your strength, your spirit, and the word that we have learned, that you would give us the grace and strength we need to avoid the sins of the tongue. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Well, y'all have a Merry Christmas, and I will see you next week, the Lord willing.